Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Wow, we got a lively audience tonight. This is the first time they said good evening back. Yeah, that's great. Should have, a, should have a great evening tonight. My name is Christopher Nikoloff. I'm head of school at the Harker School. And on behalf of the entire community, I'd like to welcome you to the Harker Speaker Series. The Harker Speaker Series uh, was launched in 2007 uh, to bring leaders and visionaries from a wide variety of fields uh, to share their expertise or unique experience with Harker parents, faculty, students, as well as the broader community. A special thanks to parent founders of the Harker Speaker Series, John and Helena Journey, uh, who are responsible for bringing the uh, outstanding speakers uh, to our school, and tonight is no exception. So I don't know if John and Helena are here, if they can uh, uh, wave and say a little round of applause for John and Helena. <laughs> Uh, also, special thanks to Pam Dickinson, Trina Coyne, and Tiffany Hurst, uh, the merry band who, behind the scenes, uh, really uh, pulled this uh, pulled this event together to and, and take care of all, all of the details. Uh, the Harker Speaker Series has a tradition of inviting a student to introduce our speaker, and tonight I am pleased to introduce Govinda Dasu. Uh, Govi is currently a senior, and he came to Harker in 2008. Uh, his favorite subject is physics, uh, specifically astrophysics. And he wanted to introduce Dr. Tartar today because his work on brown dwarfs is very similar to the research, uh, her work on uh, brown dwarfs is very similar to the research he did this summer with Professor e. Gregory Laughlin at, at UC Santa Cruz. Govi is really interested in the prospect of finding low temperatures near brown dwarf neighbors, especially those at Earth-like temperatures. In addition to his interest in research, Govi enjoys serving on the school student council, uh, running a debate website called War of Word, and participating in performing arts. And so please join me in uh, welcoming Govi to the podium. Thank you. So. This, you guys are not here for me. <laughs> you guys are here for Jill Tarter. Uh, but I'm Govi Dasu, uh, Govinda Dasu, and I'm going to introduce Jill Tarter, uh, Dr. Jill Tarter, and tell you why we're so lucky to have her speak at Harker. Dr. Tarter is currently the director of SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial in Intelligence. And Dr. Tarter, Tarter received her undergraduate degree, her physics degree from Cornell University, and her master's and PhD from UC Berkeley. For her PhD, Dr. Tarter worked on the radio research project, Serendip, the search for extraterrestrial radio emissions from nearby developed intelligent populations. She, in fact, created that clever acronym. She's also been involved in NASA's High Resolution Microwave Survey, HRMS, and was the co-director of Project Phoenix. Tarter has received a number of awards for her pioneering Include the, including the Lifetime Achievement Award by Women in at Aerospace in 1989, the Adler Planetarium Women in Space Science Award in 2003, the Telluride Tech Festival Award for, of Technology in 2001, Wonderfest's Carl Sagan Prize for Science Popularization in 2005, and a 2009 TED Prize. In addition, Tartar was elected a Fellow of the American Association for the Adva Advancement of Science in 2002, a Fellow of the California Academy for Sciences in 2003, and a Fellow of the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry. Dr. Tartar's influence has spread to American pop culture in the film Contact, where the protagonist character, Ellie Arroway, is based on Tartar. Tartar is a very mainstream and popular scientist, and according to CNN, she has sought to solve a mystery that has long intrigued scientists and science fiction buffs. Are we alone in the universe? This is indeed one of the deepest questions we can ask our intelligent society. So without further ado, here's Dr. Jill Tartar with the answer. <laughs> You're a hard act to follow, Gabby. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here tonight, John. Thank you very much for, for asking me uh, to come. 
Uh, Gary gave you one introduction. Let me tell you a little bit about how I see myself. So who am I? Well, my team uses radio telescopes to try and find evidence of extraterrestrial technology. Uh, that may sound a little familiar. So let me say, I'm the one that doesn't wear the headphones. Uh, I um, have degrees in engineering physics and astrophysics, and I've only actually had two jobs in my life. I was a NASA scientist, a project scientist for their SETI endeavor, and I was employee number one at the SETI Institute when we incorporated in 1984 to try and save NASA money. I've done a number of things under that rubric, and at the moment I'm the chief cheerleader for a, um, an innovation open community that we call SETI Quest. So, Sonata, which is SETI on the ATA. ATA is the Allen Telescope Array. I'll tell you some more about that in, in a few minutes. Um, we're all transitioning, right? At my ripe old age, I'm trying to learn how to do my business in a different way. Uh, I'm, and in the words of the open source community, we are moving away from the cathedral using large scientific instruments, doing our business all by ourselves. And we're moving into the bazaar. Right? And the bazaar is a vibrant and exciting and innovative and energetic environment with lots of wonderful ideas percolating around. But it's a little bit rough and tumble too, right? You gotta have some sharp elbows and, and, and a thick skin to do well in this environment. And that's what we're trying to learn how to do because we realize that not all smart people who are interested and passionate about SETI work for the SETI Institute and they actually can help us to improve the search. So for millennia, humans have actually been on a journey trying to seek answers. I can't promise that I have the answer tonight, Gumi. Um, but there are answers to questions about what is, what ought to be, who are we, why are we, and of course, who else might be out there. Along that journey, we've discovered um, that our universe is vast, that our sun is one of 400 billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy, that our Milky Way galaxy is one of 100 billion galaxies in the observable universe. And as vast as this is, and as wondrous as this is, in the past decade, we finally understood that this is only 4% of the mass energy density of the universe. All this stuff we've been studying for hundreds of years really amounts to only 4%. What's the rest? What's the other 96%? It's dark matter, dark energy. Dark is just an astronomical word for we don't know. <laughs> but we're going to find out. That's the wonderful thing about science is that we... Um, Reserve the right to get smarter and learn new things as we go along. Well, along this journey, 50 years ago, um, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence took another track. Um, we started to try and use the tools left over from World War II radar science, um, this, the, the tools of the radio astronomer, to see if we could find evidence of someone else's technology. So the search for extraterrestrial intelligence is really a search for someone else's technology out there. The first search was done by Frank Drake, um, who looked at two stars, Tau Ceti and Epsilon Eridani, for a couple of hundred hours with some very primitive instrumentation relative to today's tools. Um, and he didn't find evidence of extraterrestrial technology, but he did learn a very important lesson which has been part of every search thereafter. And that is that terrestrial technology can really mess up the search for extraterrestrial technology as well as enabling it. So we have the problem of discriminating our technology from theirs. And I like to think of SETI 
as departing from the millennia of humans who asked this question, are we alone? And they expected the priests or the philosophers or the wise people to tell them what they should believe. Today what we're doing is a scientific exploration. So I think about SETI as replacing the verb believe with the verb to explore. And I really hope that we can invite and have the rest of you participate with us in our exploration. So we don't presume the existence of extraterrestrial intelligence in our work. We just note the possibility, probably even the probability, uh, given the size and the uniformity of the universe we find ourselves in. So today we live in a very fragile island of life, in a universe that's full of possibilities. And some of those possibilities are becoming more obvious every day. Um, for a very long time, the idea of planets orbiting other stars was a very nice theory. And since 1995, it's become a reality. And we never see these planets, but we infer their existence because they tug on the star that they orbit. Now before Gobi's physics teacher gets all excited, <laughs> let me say, the planet doesn't orbit the star. The planet and the star orbit their common center of mass, but in most cases that's down inside the star, just not quite at its center. So a planet orbiting a star causes the star to wobble, and that's in fact what we are able to detect from a distance and deduce um, the existence of that planet. We found hundreds, 550 some odd, planets this way. Um, most of them are large, and we're just beginning to get into the realm of Earth-sized planets. So they're all together about 2,000 exoplanets and exoplanet candidates, <coughs> mostly large stars, uh, mostly large planets in short period orbits. But with this spacecraft, the Kepler mission that was launched in March of 2009, we are actually in pursuit of Earth-sized planets in orbits around stars like the Sun, where they might, in fact, be the right temperature to have liquid water, because that's where we think we might find life. So how does Kepler do this? It doesn't look at the star wobbling back and forth on the sky, but it looks at the brightness of the star. And if, in fact, the orbits of the planet and the star are appropriate and lined up, sometimes the planet passes in front of the star, and when it does, it blocks a little light from the star for a few hours. And when we stare at that star and measure its brightness with a very, very precise movie camera, we can notice that the star occasionally dims for a little while. Now this cartoon makes it look like an easy job. It's anything but easy. It takes an incredible technology to do this job. Uh, when Jupiter passes in front of the sun, it blocks 1% of the sun's light. When the planet like the Earth passes in front of the sun, it blocks only one part in a hundred thousandth of the sun's light. So Earth-sized planets are very, very difficult to find. But indeed, that's what Kepler is trying to do. Now, not all planets will be, have their orbits lined up so that they will transit their star. And so if you want to find planets with this transit technique, you have to look at a lot of stars. And where do you find a lot of stars? you find a lot of stars in the Milky Way, in the plain of the Milky Way. So if you were in Northern California looking up at a clear summer sky, you would see this beautiful arc of stars stretching in this case from Mount Shasta on the right to Mount Lassen on the left. And these are the southernmost uh, volcanoes in the arc that comes down from, uh, from Washington through Oregon. 
And I love this picture, not only because it's quite beautiful, because, but because over there near Mount Lassen, that's where my observatory is. So I think of ourselves as sitting at the base of the rainbow of stars, looking for the pot of gold that might be buried there. Kepler actually points not quite into the Milky Way because there would be too many stars there. But the Kepler field of view, which is uh, shown here by those 42 white rectangles, uh, is up above the plane of the Milky Way between the constellations Cygnus and Lyra. And those 42 rectangles represent arrays of CCD detectors, charge couple devices, the same, the same thing that makes your cell phone camera work, CCDs. However, Kepler doesn't have just three megapixels or 10 megapixels. Kepler's got a 95 megapixel camera and it works brilliantly. Uh, as we found out when we opened the shrouds on the telescope on orbit. So this is the first light from Kepler and it's probably too bright up here, but there are four, there are four and a half million stars that are visible in that field of view uh, to the magnitude limit that Kepler can detect. And Kepler has chosen to stare continuously at 165,000 of those stars. And as of the 1st of February this year, when the Kepler's team released its first large set of data, we know that 1,235 of those stars are actually winking at us. We've seen transits by planets around 1,235 of those stars. 184 of these dots in the Kepler field, the red ones, are giant-sized planets. Um, uh, 600, okay, come on. 662 of them are more like the size of Neptune. There are 288 planets, candidates here, that are something we don't have in our own solar system. We call them super-Earths. We'd love to know more about what those planets are like. And 68 of them are actually Earth-sized planets. And among these 1,235 planets, there are 60 that seem to be in the Goldilocks zone. Not too hot, not too cold, just the right distance from their star so that they might be habitable in the sense of having liquid water on the surface. These results were released with huge fanfare in February. And at the end of last month, with no fanfare at all, Kepler released yet another large set of data from more recent observations, and they've doubled the size of this exoplanet candidate population. And we know with confidence that there are many more to come. Now, if this kind of Skittles diagram isn't to your taste, how about corn cobs, all right? <laughs> Here's those 1,235 exoplanet candidates shown in projection against their star. So the disks are the stars shown in relative size, and the colors show the temperatures of the stars, the red ones being cooler, the blue ones being brighter, and you can see little spots. And for comparison, that's the sun. And you can see a dot in front of that. That's not the Earth. That's Jupiter. Mm. You have to go this large in order to even begin to see the little Earth in front of the sun. This is the kind of job that Kepler is doing every day. Now, Kepler, the spacecraft, is named after a scientist who provided us with the laws that tell us how planets move around their stars. Right? And so, for hundreds of years, we've built these beautiful uh, mechanical orreries that show how things revolve and, and rotate. And you turn the crank and everything moves around with clockwork precision, just as Kepler's laws, which are incredibly beautifully simple, tell us they should. And I think it's actually the simplicity of Kepler's laws that over the past few hundred years has sort of lulled us into 
adapting a kind of hubris. So we thought that when we began to find planets around other stars, those planetary systems would be just like ours. Everything in a plane, circular orbits, the big gas giant planets on the outside, the little rocky planets close into the star. We were totally, totally wrong. The first exoplanet we found was more massive than Jupiter, close enough to its star to orbit in only a little over four days. And when we look at the incredible richness of the planetary systems with multiple planets that Kepler is beginning to show us, we see the real auroraries. This is so amazing. There is so much information in here on planetary dynamics that will help us understand how nature forms planetary systems. And this kind of beauty reminds us how difficult it is with a sample of one to predict what actually will be out there in the real world. Nature is incredibly versatile. Now, of these planetary systems with interesting dynamics, perhaps the most intriguing was just announced a couple of weeks ago by my colleague Lawrence Doyle at the SETI Institute. This is Kepler-16b. This is a planet that orbits not one star, but two. This is an eclipsing binary star system, and it has in a circumbinary orbit, a small planet. This is, in fact, Kepler-16b. That planet is Luke Skywalker's world on Tatooine with two suns. Um, you can see the size of our sun for comparison. Both of the stars in this system are much smaller than the sun, and Kepler is about 30 percent. Kepler-16b is about 30 percent of the mass of Jupiter. The stars orbit each other with a period of 41 days, and Kepler-16b has an orbit of about 229 days. It is not as far from the stars as the Earth is from the Sun, but in fact Kepler-16b is probably too cold to have liquid water and be habitable. But it shows us that it's possible to have planets in stable orbits around binary stars, and since most stars out there are binaries. This is a whole lot more real estate that we know is out there, and some of it might be habitable.